What is up, everybody? It is Monday, November 21st. Happy Thanksgiving week. Um, everyone ready to eat a whole lot of good, delicious food. Uh, this coming week, uh, myself and my guys at the fire station this past weekend, we prepared. We did a pre-Thanksgiving Thanksgiving to make sure that we are prepared for the week to come, and it was awesome. So, uh, welcome to your uh, weekly update, episode number 10. Uh, this is our 10th uh, episode. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, this uh, this week is going to be a YouTube video for uh, all of you guys that are traveling or got a house full of kids or got a house full of family. Uh, this will allow you to watch it in a little bit more of your own time setting. And usually these are a little bit quicker. So, uh, this is only our second one of these, so if you like them, let us know. If you don't, then uh, also let us know. So um, you guys know how this works uh, from last time. Uh, somewhere throughout this video, I'm going to put a uh, question for you to answer, um, and you'll answer that via a Teams message um, or an email, whatever's easiest for you, preferably a Teams message, but it, you know, if email is easier, then just email me. Uh, and once I get that answer to the question, then uh, that'll give you credit for this, uh, for this weekly update. So for those of you that are still working towards uh, getting that homework assignment dropped, that lowest homework grade dropped and turned into 100, uh, this will count for that. For those of you who are not working on it, I still encourage you to watch these as uh, this is our best form of communication throughout the week. So without further ado, let's get started. So uh, weekly update, episode number 10. This is our 10th episode of this. Uh, you know, these these are important to me. Uh, this is not an, an SOE, a School of EMS regulated thing. This is something that is specific to our class. And um, I'm proud to say it's made it to 10 episodes. When I came up with this idea, I didn't think it would, um, and so I'm glad that we have continued and pushed through and continued to still do them. We've missed a few weeks here and there, but that's okay. Um, so I put a lot of work into these. I put a lot of work into these lectures, and uh, I just want to make sure that you guys get the uh, best possible uh, best possible education. And so I appreciate all you guys that make an effort. Uh, to come and be with us every week. We have a really good time. If you don't, you should definitely start. It's a great time. Um, and uh, yeah, so the only other announcement I have for you guys is um, monthly instructor emails. So to give you guys yet another form of communication to myself and Aaron, I'm going to send you guys starting in December, the first month, the first week of December. Sometime around that first weekend, I'm going to send you guys an email. This is going to be just, hey, how you doing? Do you have any issues, questions, comments, concerns, anything like that? Uh, that is just another opportunity for you to get in touch with me. If you don't have anything, uh, you don't feel obligated to respond to those. Uh, this is not like your homework grades or your discussion comments, the comments that Aaron and I put on this. This is not a mandatory response. This is just a way for me to reach out, hey, how you doing? And if you have a problem, this is a way to get in touch with me that way. So if you don't respond, don't worry. It's not gonna affect your evaluation, your grade. I'm not gonna give you any dirty looks, anything like that. It is just an opportunity, another opportunity for you to get in touch with me um, or Aaron. If you, if you want to respond, that's great. And if you have an issue, of course, we're gonna take care of it. Uh, so. Uh, that's all my announcements for this week. Don't have any quiz questions for this week either. So we're going to move straight into the topic for discussion. So this week's topic for discussion is called Escape Goat. Escaping the norm of CHF or congestive heart failure. So as we move into respiratory illnesses this week, last week we did anatomy, physiology, this week we're gonna move into respiratory illnesses a little bit. I wanna talk about a subgenre of CHF. Now this is 
not going to be a generalized CHF because uh, you're going to get generalized CHF in your lectures, and I'm not going to rehash what's going on there. This is a special CHF. This is one that I've taken an interest in, and it's near and dear to me, and it's pretty interesting. Um, it's pretty interesting. So this is just going to be a quick lecture. Um, you know, this is just some of my thoughts, my research on this particular topic. Hopefully you guys can learn something and take it from it. Uh, if you have any feedback about this particular topic, or maybe you've seen one of these patients, please reach out and let us know. And uh, we'd love to talk to you guys about that. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema, or SCAPE as it's um, known in its um, shortened form. Uh, now you guys understand the title, ESCAPE. You see what I did there? Uh, we're going to escape the norm of just the regular fluid overload CHF today. We're going to add some more depth and dexterity on it uh, just so you guys can kind of expand your minds, expand your horizons. Now, this is some of this is kind of advanced stuff. Um, so don't think, don't worry that, oh my gosh, this is going to be on my national registry test. I'm freaking out. This is just more knowledge for your knowledge toolbox. So uh, sympathetic crashing. Acute pulmonary edema, SCAPE, uh, you might have heard of it as flash pulmonary, flash pulmonary edema, uh, but basically the definition here is this is the acute and extreme end of the pulmonary edema spectrum. So a lot of pulmonary edema forms. Uh, you have people that live with CHF every single day of their life, and some people live in pulmonary edema for days and weeks and months at a time and never call EMS, never go into the hospital, never seek treatment, never take medicines. This is the opposite form of that. This is the most extreme form of pulmonary edema because not only do we have pulmonary edema, so we have a fluid overload, we also have a sympathetic component to it now where it's affecting our cardiovascular system. Uh, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But we are talking about the extreme form of pulmonary edema here today. So a better definition of this that I'll put into words is uh, a sympathetic surge occurs as a result of decreased systemic perfusion resulting in further increases in afterload causing the patient to decompensate. So a lot of big words there. Um, so let's break it down a little bit. So we know that we have pulmonary edema like we have in normal CHF, but we have a sympathetic surge um, because our decreased systemic perfusion, that increases the afterload. We'll talk about afterload here in just a little bit, but that's going to increase the afterload. So we've added a new component, a, cardi a, a further cardiovascular component to our CHF house, if you'll call it that, the CHF house. Uh, and that increase in afterload is going to cause our patient to decompensate, decompensate rapidly, um, usually. So very basic pathophys. Let's go into it just a little bit. Um, so you you know about CHF and how that works. You know how pulmonary fluid homeostasis works. There's forces that drive the fluid um, that keep it in the alveolar spaces. Uh, but now with with scape with that systemic crashing pulmon acute pulmonary edema, we have increased cardiac filling pressures transmitting to the pulmonary capillaries. So you have now another force in there which drives that interstitial fluid into the pulmonary alveoli. Let me say that one more time because it was a lot of big words. So you now, with SCAPE, you have increased cardiac filling pressure, which transmits to pulmonary, which transmits to your pulmonary capillaries that eventually drives intervascular fluid into the pulmonary interstitium and the alveoli. So we've got fluid where fluid doesn't need to be. We've got fluid where air needs to be, and that's, that's not good. 
Uh, breaking it down even further, you have three stages of this, three stages of scape. You have the distension of the small pulmonary capillaries due to that increased left atrial pressure due to that increased afterload, which stage two causes that interstitial edema, which stage three is flooding of the alveolar space causing hypoxia. So pressure in the heart is increased, puts fluid into the interstitial space of the lungs and the alveoli, which causes the alveolar space to flood, which in turn makes hypoxia. So it's pretty simple when you break it down like that. Um, but, you know, just want to try and break it down even further for you guys. So um, let's talk about how this is different from fluid overload subacute pulmonary edema or regular pulmonary edema, regular CHF. So um, with SCAPE, with the systemic crash and acute pulmonary edema, you occur within minutes to hours. So the guidelines to call, to diagnose SCAPE, like a hospital diagnosis is six hours or less. Um, so that occurs within minutes to hours, not in hours to days. So your regular CHF, your regular fluid overload is gonna occur within hours to days. So minutes to hours versus hours to days. Uh, with the scape, you're going to have that excessive afterload that causes a fluid shift into the lungs. Uh, so the excessive afterload component is specific to systemic crashing, acute pulmonary edema. When you're looking at regular pulmonary edema, the what they call the fluid overload subacute pulmonary edema, that is just going to be simply fluid overload. But when we look at the uh, sympathetic crashing, we're going to have excessive afterload. So we have added in that cardiac component. We'll talk about afterload here in just a second. Um, your blood pressure is always going to be hypertensive, hypertensive, high blood pressure. Uh, with regular CHF, you can have hypertensive, normotensive, or um, hypotensive in some cases. This is always going to be hypertension. I'll tell you why here in just a second. Um, and then the treatments. The treatments differ. Uh, so with regular fluid overload, the goal is to treat the respiratory distress, yes, but th the, the overall goal is to remove the fluid. So use things like Lasix, other diuretics to get rid of that fluid, yes. In this case, um, that is not going to be just the cure. The, the smoking gun here, the true cure of this is going to be high dose nitroglycerin or another blood pressure control medication and non-invasive ventilation, which will be your CPAP and BiPAP. So I know you guys are studying CPAP and BiPAP this week. That's what your discussion question is about. So we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a little bit, but um, I'm a big supporter of CPAP. It's a big, big... Uh, big fan in my book. So, okay. I told you guys we're going to talk about afterload a little bit. Let's do a quick look over on some afterload. Now, we haven't really got into cardiology yet. That comes later this semester. And so I'm going to give you just like a quick run over of afterload so you're not just confused and looking at me like I'm stupid. Uh, so afterload. So as basic as it gets, the afterload is the amount of pressure that the heart needs to exert to eject blood during ventricular contraction. Say that one more time. The afterload is the amount of pressure that the heart needs to exert to eject the blood during ventricular contraction. So you have a certain amount of pressure that your heart has to meet to overpower that pressure gradient to eject blood during ventricular contraction. That is what your afterload is. So now you know. Um, and we'll go into that more as we get into cardiology now. So, okay, so let's talk about how we identify this. Um, so the diagnosis of SCAPE, uh, sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema, is going to be a clinical diagnosis, of course. Uh, so the, the, the key here, the main thing, is these patients are going to present uh, with a relatively abrupt onset of that quick shortness of breath, and in minutes to hours, we are now at life-threatening pulmonary edema. So you run a, a lot of calls out the field. 
respiratory distress, shortness of breath, it's going to be one of the most common uh, subgenres of calls that you're going to run. And a lot of these people are going to say like, oh, I've been short of breath for like a couple of days, or I've been short of breath a couple of weeks, I've been short of breath since I had COVID two years ago. Like it's, it's all very non-acute, all very normal for them. Uh, this is their normal breathing ability is they're just short of breath. Uh, this is different. Uh, this is going to be an abrupt onset, quick. They're, they're all of a sudden going to feel it. Um, and then it's going to progress. You have minutes to hours to life-threatening. This patient needs to be intubated and on a ventilator that bad of pulmonary edema. So that's how quick it, it, it does. And that comes into our treatments here in just a second. So... Um, they're gonna present with extremely severe respiratory distress, acute onset of six hours, like I said earlier. They're gonna be restless. Uh, this is gonna be the key. They're gonna feel restless. They're gonna feel that impending doom, like they can't escape. Uh, that's gonna be pretty paramount whenever you see that. A lot of these regular shortness of breath patients that you run on the reg, they don't have that restlessness component that we see in these scape patients. Uh, they're going to be diaphoretic, they're going to be hypoxic, they're going to show tachycardia, and then they're going to have marked hypertension. We talked about that earlier when comparing it to standard fluid overload, marked hypertension always. Uh, so we'll talk about why here in just a second, but you're going to put these patients on your stretchers. They're not going to be able to lay down. They're going to fight you to put the bed at its highest setting because they're going to be so short of breath and it's going to be so bad. So Remember those things, try and differentiate these from the standard um, from the standard uh, shortness of breath patients that you're going to see. Uh, so the reason why we're going to see this marked hypertension with this um, is because you're going to uh, escape is, is a subset of what we call hypertensive heart failure. So it's, it's heart failure that always has hypertension. Now, heart failure does not always result in hypertension. You can have heart failure that turns into cardiogenic shock that then becomes hypotensive. This is a subset of hypertensive heart failure, so it's always going to be hypertensive, and they're always going to present with this high systolic blood pressure because of this sympathetic response. This is a sympathetic response due to that decreased perfusion causing the high blood pressure. So, we know how to identify it now. So let's see how we're going to treat it. Uh, so, and most to add to the identification, most of these patients are almost always going to have some sort of congestive heart failure history. Um, this is not usually something that results from a patient that has no respiratory etiologies on their history. This is usually something that we see with patients that have that respiratory history. So that's another thing to look at whenever you're pulling tools out of your toolbox. All right. So really quick, let's look at some treatments. So the theme of this whole scape thing is the rapid decompensation. So this almost always results in a rapid decompensation. Remember that minutes to hours instead of the hours to days. So when we have rapid decompensation, we have to have rapid interventions. That is most important. So Number one, first, foremost, most important, get these patients on positive pressure, non-invasive ventilation. CPAP or BiPAP is the most important intervention that you can give these patients. We're going to give them some CPAP. We're going to give them some BiPAP. That's going to, one, help their respiratory distress. Two, it's going to start pushing that fluid out. We really want to make sure that we do that. What is one thing we should consider with this? Well, of course, these patients are already restless because they can't breathe. They're restless because they have scape. They're going through this terrible pulmonary edema. So we want to consider coaching these patients with the mask, coaching them, helping them put it on. But obviously, we have pharmaceuticals as well. A little bit of Versed, um, a little bit of Ativan, never hurt anybody. And like I said, these patients are always going to be hypertensive, so you shouldn't have any blood pressure concerns. So CPAP or BiPAP, want to make sure you get that on quick. 
Coach the patient with it. That's the most important thing. Make sure they know. And then if they're still restless, make sure that you give them a little something. A little sedation, a small dose of a sedative hypnotic will do wonders for these people. Number two, second and most important treatment in a escape patient is going to be blood pressure or afterload control. So remember that afterload is increased. That pressure that the heart has to pump against is higher. And so we want to make sure that we're controlling this afterload. So a little bit of context on this. You have excessively high blood pressure, increases the afterload on that left ventricle, pushes those that fluid back into the lungs. The, the fluid is, is not being effectively pumped out to the rest of the body. The afterload is high, which is pushing it back into our pulmonary circulation, promoting that fluid back up into the lungs. This is the fundamental pathophysiology of SCAPE right there. Uh, so you want to rapidly reduce that blood pressure, rapidly reduce that blood pressure. So this is where it gets interesting. This is where our abilities as paramedics kind of goes away because we don't have protocols for this yet. And if you do, I want to know about it because I am jealous. This is the treatment right here. High dose nitroglycerin bolus and infusion. We're not talking about 0.4 of a sublingual tablet. No, no, no. This is IV nitroglycerin or Tridil as it's called by its trade name. I'm going to pull up a sample protocol for you guys and just read it to you. And this will kind of shed some light on how high dosing we're uh, talking about here. So Sometimes it's going to depend on blood pressure. This particular protocol that I pulled up does depend on blood pressure, but we're talking about nitroglycerin boluses as high as 1,000 micrograms. That's a milligram of nitroglycerin. That's a lot of nitroglycerin. Uh, so a 1,000 microgram nitroglycerin IV bolus, and then a 100 microgram per minute IV infusion. So 1,000 microgram bolus up to 1,000 microgram bolus followed by a 100 microgram per minute infusion. That's a lot of, that's a lot of nitroglycerin. That is a lot of nitroglycerin. You know, we're going from giving them a little tab whenever they've got chest pain to now we're giving them 1,000 milligrams. Uh, that's like two and a half tablets. That's a lot of nitroglycerin, and it's going IV, so it's going fast. We're going straight to the system. We're doing a system shock. But what did I just say? The treatment is to rapidly reduce the blood pressure. I mean rapidly. We want to get it down, and I'll tell you why here in a little bit. Uh, so the question is why? Why do you use high-dose nitroglycerin? Uh, why not use you know, something else other than nitroglycerin. It's simple. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it as simple as possible. Two things. You want to reduce the preload. You want to reduce the afterload. That's it. So reduce the preload. Uh, vasodilation causes less return to the heart. So less systemic return to the heart. And then reduce that afterload. You're going to reduce that stress, reduce that pressure that the heart needs to eject against. So high-dose nitroglycerin. Why? Because we want to reduce that preload. And we want to reduce that afterload. Uh, some other treatments that you can do that they may do in the um, ED that we don't have the capability to do is uh, cardine or other blood pressure medicines. Uh, they're just, in what I've seen and what I've read on this particular topic, they are not as rapid as um, nitroglycerin. So pretty crazy. Like I said, if you guys have a protocol for IV nitroglycerin, y'all are using it for something like this or something else, let me know. I want to know. I want to talk to you about it just out of curiosity. When I flew, we had a protocol for IV nitroglycerin, and it was so cool. Now that we're on the ground, I want to implement one in my department uh, for this IV nitroglycerin. Uh, and so I'm interested to hear your thoughts about it. So if you have one in your organization, let me know. I'm curious. 
All right, so finishing up here, why? Why is this important to us? Why is a subset of CHF important to us? Why does any of this matter? So the main thing is we need to learn and recognize and implement these proper treatments. So when I tell you guys your takeaways here in just a second, you will understand what I'm talking about. But with this disease process, it, it is so important that we recognize this and that we implement the right treatments. And if we can't implement the right treatments, then get them to the place that can, get them to the ER that can, uh, because it makes a difference in SCAPE. It makes a difference for these people. So it's important that we recognize these things. Um, and then another one, having further knowledge of SCAPE or sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema allows us not to treat all CHFers the same. Um, in paramedicine, it's easy uh, to look at all CHF the same, like, oh, this is just a CHF exacerbation. But we need to be challenging ourselves every day. You guys are the new generation of paramedicine, and until we get further in our knowledge base and abilities and, and what we know on the current best practices, this career field is not going to elevate itself to where I think it should be. And so... We need to have a better knowledge of these CHF subsets so that we're not all treating them the same. This patient does not need Lasix right now. They might in 30 minutes, but they don't need Lasix right now. They need non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and they need blood pressure control. So let me tell you why. So your takeaway for today is... Look around, decide, make a call. So, you know, it, you know, in the military, you know, when, you know, or like, for example, uh, when, I was, when I was on the SWAT team and we would be, you know, busting these doors in, uh, you know, the, the, the goal was to look around, decide, make a call. You read a lot. I read a lot of military books uh, with special operations. What is their goal? Make you know, make entry, look around, decide, make a call. So that's what it is. Recognize scape, make a call, treat appropriately. If this is the scape patient, don't sit around on scene and twiddle your thumbs. Make a call. Get in route to the hospital because you probably don't have high dose nitro. Make that call, treat appropriately, throw them on the CPAP, go to the hospital ASAP as soon as possible. Uh, statistics show that rapid use of non-invasive ventilation and high-dose nitroglycerin have been shown to decrease intubations and ICU cases in congestive heart failure with SCAPE. I'm going to say that one more time and then we're done. Rapid use of non-invasive ventilation and high-dose nitroglycerin have been shown to decrease intubation and ICU cases in CHF scape patients. That's the goal. What is our goal? Do no harm. Do what's best for the patients. Be patients' advocates. If you recognize scape, your recognition of sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema might be what saves this patient from having to get intubated and from ending up in ICU. Now, you're going to go into the ER and you're going to be like, hey, doc, I think this is scape. I think this is sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema. He might look at you like you're stupid because we're not supposed to be this smart, but we are because we are getting smarter every day. But I guarantee you, if it truly is scape, then you are going to buy this patient you're, you're going to buy them an early admission out of the hospital. You're going to avoid them from getting an ET tube, and you're going to avoid them from hopefully having to go to the ICU, or worse, death. Uh, so remember, recognize, make a call, treat it appropriately. So, all right, that is escape. That is a scapegoat, uh, escaping the norms of CHF. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Remember, if you guys have a protocol for high-dose nitroglycerin, I want to know about it. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about it some more. Now, 
I know what you all want to hear. You all want to know what the team's question is for this week so that you can get credit for this weekly update. So here we go. So what is your favorite Thanksgiving food? I know that mine is green bean casserole, but I'm also a stickler for pies. I love all pies, any kind of pies I will eat. So that's the question. That is how you get credit for this week's weekly update. Send me a Teams message. Send me an email with what is your favorite Thanksgiving food. I look forward to hearing that from you guys. Listen, everybody have a great Thanksgiving. You're not going to be hearing from me much this week because I'm not going to bother you guys, but make sure you get all your assignments turned in. Make sure you're staying up on all your work. And most importantly, everyone have a great and safe Thanksgiving, and we will see you guys next week.